Mr. Speaker, uh, I am very proud to rise tonight to speak to Bill 269, an act to amend the Fisheries Act, a prohibition of the deposit of raw sewage from the member for Regina Capel, who also had been Speaker, and I must say I probably have not agreed with many of the things the member for Regina Capel has said over the years. However, I think the issue of raw sewage in our water systems is a very, very important thing to be discussing, and I'm glad that we have an opportunity here. We know that there's an element of it, this is under provincial jurisdiction, but the fact that people should be able to know that we have a top quality environmental system in this country to keep people safe should be an issue that we're all deeply concerned with. And I think um, my honourable colleagues here can probably speak of many uh, municipalities where we, have, uh, where we have issues of raw sewage being pumped into waters and rivers. I think what, one of the things that I'm, I'm not really seeing in the bill, however, is the effect we see in the direct areas under federal jurisdiction, which is, of course, on First Nation reserves. And I think it's really, really important for Canadians to understand that across Canada, there's a two-tiered system of infrastructure, a two-tiered system of health, a two-tiered system of education, a two-tiered system of rights. And those are the rights that exist for the citizens of this country that are under uh, the provincial or territorial governments, and those other citizens who are living on the reserves of our nation who are under the mandate of the Department of Indigenous Services, the old Indian Affairs, the ultimate colonial system that there is, and the chronic underfunding that we see in basic infrastructure. So when the Liberal government ran in 2015 on getting rid of the water crisis and that they told everyone they'd have mission accomplished uh, by the beginning of 2021, it inspired and galvanized Canadians because Canadians asked themselves, how is it possible in a nation as rich as Canada, how is it possible in a country with the greatest water resources on the planet that so many people can't turn on their tap and drink safely. And the fact of dirty water is also tied to sewage and the broken sewage systems. So when the Prime Minister ran, or when the, when the Prime Minister was elected on that promise, people believed he would follow through. I mean, should be, what would be an easier thing for the lib new incoming Liberal government to do than to ensure that we have proper water? But what the Liberal government didn't promise to do was to deal with the water systems, and that includes sewage. And why is that important to understand that distinction? Is because they decided that they were going to do it on the cheap. And I would say, Mr. Speaker, I remember the, the terrible Keshechuan water crisis, and we are in a terrible crisis right now in Keshechuan with COVID, with the member for, the member for uh, the, the Indigenous Services Minister who sat on his hands and done nothing up until this COVID crisis is blown out of proportion. And it brought me back to when I was first elected in 2005, when we had an E. coli outbreak in Keshechuan. And we saw the same lack of action. And at that time, uh, it was the sewage system in Keshechuan that was built right near the water treatment plant because it was done cheap. And so when the rains came, and the sewage treatment system, the, the, the settling ponds overflowed, they flowed into the water system. And in Keshechuan, we didn't even have a, a proper uh, the pipe backup, a backup system so that if something f comes in on the outtake, it actually stops the incoming sewage. They didn't bother to put that in because they did it on the cheap. So why do we need to think about it in that perspective? Is it the water crisis that caused the E. coli in that community that led to mass evacuations of the entire community was the result of the failed sewage system? So when the Prime Minister failed on his latest promise on water, People are saying to him, how is this possible? This was supposed to be this Prime Minister's number one promise, that he was going to deliver clean water. But if you look at community after community and you look at the Indigenous Services list of communities with safe water, what they're focused on, Mr. Speaker, is always on the press release and not actually assessing the real problems. 
The amount of times they say, oh, we've gotten rid of this boiled water advisory and that boiled water advisory. I've been in communities where they've told us, oh, we got rid of six boiled water advisories. Yeah, well, it's because it was like at the very edge of town, there was a building that had a well, and now that well's clean. But the rest of the community isn't safe. That is not a comprehensive uh, solution. So I had asked the... Uh, a parliamentary budget officer to cost out the Prime Minister's promises. They were very clear. The government was deliberately underfunding. They were deliberately underfunding in terms of the training that's needed to run a water treatment plant. They were deliberately underfunding on the issue of maintenance. Only in the Department of Indian Affairs could they cut a ribbon at a plant and walk away and think that there's never ever going to be a need for maintenance. I mean, any municipality will tell you things break. So you have isolated communities like Martin Falls, the Goki Post, when um, sewage hits, uh, the sewage lifts are hit by lightning and the, the boards uh, cack out and they call the department and say, listen, our sewage lifts aren't working anymore. And the feds say, well, that's not our issue. Well, how is a community of 300 going to fix uh, the fried out sewage lifts? So what happens? Well, the sewage gets into the water. And then the water treatment plant starts to go down. And then the feds say, well, we're not going to fix that because it's not in our capital budget. But they will spend upwards of $2 million a year on bottled water. And that bottled water money is not new money. It comes from another community where they were actually going to do infrastructure. So they're taking money from an infrastructure project in one community that desperately needs infrastructure and they're buying bottled water in another community because they're refusing to actually fix the issue. And what they are doing, Mr. Speaker, when they're looking at how to fix water, they're looking at what's the cheapest, what's the easiest, and how do we get out without having any more costs. So I'll give you the example of the community of Attawapiskat. The water supply is a stagnant pool. It doesn't matter how many chemicals you pump in that water, you will never get good, clean, safe water. So the more chemicals you pump into the water, the more caustic it becomes, the more damage it does to children's skin. It is really, really something to see, Mr. Speaker, to see little children with open wounds all over their bodies living in homes in Canada. And you could go to any northern First Nation and you will see the effects of these, on these children. And then the government, every now and then the media will pay attention and the government will say, we don't understand the mysterious cause of these illnesses and the rashes. Well, it's obvious. What's happened is that because you have a stagnant pool of water and you dump it full of chlorine to make it drinkable, that when the children are being bathed, it's damaging their skin, their skin start to open, and that's when the infections get in. And we've had this in so many communities. I've had children medevaced out because of these conditions. The other issue, Mr. Speaker, is uh, you could look at Niskandiga, 26 years without water. And the Minister of Indigenous Services keeps scratching his head. He can't figure out why he can't get clean water to Niskandiga. It's because they're willing to build a plant, but they're not willing to build all the infrastructure that supports a plant. So a municipality needs proper water plant, they need a proper source of water, they need proper pipes, they need an entire system in order to get water to the community. Someone from Niskanaga said to me, yeah, what they're offering them to do is put a new engine in a rotted out Ford vehicle and think we can drive it down the road. You can't do it without the proper infrastructure. So you need proper piping, you need a proper water source, and you need a plant that's actually built for the needs of the community, something that the Department of Indigenous Services will never do. We also see, Mr. Speaker, the same companies getting hired and hired and hired again. Now, if in any other business or any municipality, a company built a water plant and it failed, there would be an investigation. Do you think that that company would get the contract the next time? Not a chance. But in the Department of Indigenous Services, the fact that a water plant fails, oh well, whatever, just another day at the office, the bonuses still go out to the senior bureaucrats and things don't change. This is the fundamental inequities that people are facing. You're dealing with communities like Manawaki, just up the road, a hundred and some kilometers from Ottawa. 
Kitigan ZB Reserve, we can't get clean water, but beside it in the municipality of Maniwaki, we have clean water. Why is that? It's because one is under a provincial system, and under that provincial jurisdiction, there are clear, clear standards, there are obligations, there are rules in place, and they have to deliver clean water to their community. But the neighboring, municip the neighboring reserve is under the federal government, so you don't have any obligations. You don't have any standards, because the feds don't want to put the standards in place because they don't want to spend the money. That is what systemic discrimination looks like, Mr. Speaker. It's in the water, it's in the sewage, it's in the school systems, it's in the failed health. So I'm very interested in this bill and I'm very glad that I had a chance and I'll be here all week taking questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Reason.